Well hello internet and welcome to my closure video tutorial. In this one tutorial I'm going to cover the course syntax of the entire language. In the description underneath the video you'll find timestamps to all the individual parts so you don't have to watch everything all at once or you could just use this to look for specific things you're interested in. Also in the description underneath the video I have a link in which I show how to install both Emacs as well as how to set up the whole entire closure system I have right here. Of course you don't need to use Emacs Emacs with closure. Everything I cover here is going to work with any editor, but I just thought I'd use that because it's used everywhere else. And I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. All right, so here is Emacs, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by creating a project, and I'm going to use Line and Gen to create said project. And how you do that, this is just in a regular terminal. And this would work the same on a command line if you install everything that I, you know, have set up here on Windows or Linux, of course, or anything else. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go line, new, app, and what do I want to call this? Let's just call it tutorial. That's quite simple. And then all that's going to load up. And there we go. And I can then come in and change directory to tutorial. And then we can see all the different things we have here. And I'm going to change my directory to the source directory and then to tutorial. And there we are. And there is the core closure file that we are going to be putting all of our code into. And how we go and open that, in Emacs anyway, is down here. You're going to see I'm going to go Control and X and Control and F. And I'm going to type in core.clj. Hopefully you can see that. If you couldn't, view it fuel screen. And you can see here, I'm going to go control X and control plus 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 and increase the size of my code here on the left side. And then I need to decide what I'm going to do. I'm going to go CX and O to jump over to the terminal side. And I'm going to be running all the code, some code on the left, some code on the right, and so forth and so on. Now to get the code here to start executing, I'm going to go MX and then I'm going to type in CIDR dash jack dash in. And you can see that everything came up here on the bottom of the screen, CX and C++. And I can go CX and O, jump over here, and go CX and 0 to close that. So why don't I just have the code on the top and then run everything in the bottom. So we can just go and increase that a little bit more. And there you go, you'll be able to see all that. All right, so up here at the very top, I declare a namespace. And just like all namespaces, it's just going to provide a unique name for my functions. And on the next line, we have our, our, our basically our closure files are going to run on the Java virtual machine. So we're going to need to define a class. And we do that. And execution is going to start in the main file that we have right here. And I can jump down to the bottom of the screen. Well, I'm actually there already. So I can just do this. And to run main, I can just go and put parentheses and a dash and main and parentheses. And you can see that hello world executes down there. So first thing I want to talk about is variables. So variables are going to be immutable inside of closure, which means the value cannot be changed once it's set. Of course, there are situations in which you can change, but I'll get into that as the tutorial continues. And they're going to be defined by going DEF. And then you're going to have the name that's going to start either with a letter or an underscore. And then you're also going to be allowed to have numbers and so forth and to create one you could just go random variable and 10 and there you go and what that actually creates is what is called a long and a long is going to be a very large number it's going to be in between those two areas right there and basically the way that data types work in closure is that types are going to be assigned based on the value that you assign to it so if you go and just define any type of whole number, you're going to get a long. And if you would instead come in and define, let's say, a double and like that, that's going to be a double. And if you want to see the range for doubles, they are going to fall within that category. So very, very, very large numbers, as you can see. Another data type that you're going to have are going to be Booleans. And Booleans are either going to have true or false as a value. And you're going to be able to get the data type by just going type. And let's say we have false inside of there. And if you want to execute directly inside of your code, you just go CX and CE 
And you can see right there, it came back as a Boolean. Some other neat things that you can do. Oh, basically down inside of main, if you're wondering what this is, this is just describing what the function does. And this right here is going to be the arguments received by the function. This is going to create a function. That's command for creating function. And all commands inside of closure are going to be surrounded with parentheses. This is the function name, of course. And this is going to be how we are going to print out our code. All right, so let's go and just get rid of hello world directly out of there. And let's go and write some code inside of this. All right, so let's go define and we can say a long and 15. I can then come inside of here and go nil. Nil is what is used to check for no value. So I can go nil question mark and a long right like that and I can jump down into the bottom and we can run this guy. Whoops, forgot to do something. Uh, CX and the letter O jump back up inside. And what I can do to recompile this is to just go CC and CK. That's gonna compile the code. And then I can jump back down inside of this guy and hit the meta key and P and execute it. And you can see that it comes back as false because there is a value assigned. I'm gonna stop doing as much of the Emacs stuff here, but I just wanted to cover it in the beginning just because you might be confused. All right, so let's jump back up inside of here. Uh, some other different commands that we have. I can check if a value is positive or not. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up inside of here and check that. And how you check for positive values is you just go pause and whatever, and I'm gonna say 15 and you can see that that comes back as true. I can also check if something is negative by just going negative and question mark, and you can see that that comes back as false. I can check if something is even. You can see once again, that comes back as false. I can also come in and check if something is odd, and that comes back as true. We can check if something is a number with number and the question mark. We can check if something is an integer, with the tr and you see that comes back as true. We can also check if it's a float, of course. And of course, it's probably better if you have a cheat sheet in front of you that I, that I provide in the description. Of course, it's free. And there is float. You can see everything's pretty simple and self-explanatory. And I'll get into more advanced stuff here as we continue on. And there you can see that that's also not zero. All right, so there's just a rundown of using variables and different data types. And now I'd like to talk about how we can format our output. Okay, so I am going to be able to use format, I'm gonna be able to use print, print line, and string concatenators, so many different commands that are available. But I just wanna cover a couple things here. So this is format. So let's say I wanna put a string directly inside of a string. I can do something like this is a string and a percent sign and S, close that off, and then we'll put a string like that. Of course, I'm gonna have to create a string and that's easy enough to do. Let's go define a string and let's just give it the value of hello because that works. And I'm gonna do a couple of these different guys. We can also come in and use the format again to add spaces. So I can do something like five spaces and then I'm gonna go and put the percent sign again and five and D. And let's say I wanna do that with a long, we can do that. And we can come in and we can define our long. So a long, and let's just give it a value of 15 because that works pretty good. We can also come in and do format and we could do, uh, let's say we want to have leading zeros do that I'm gonna execute this in a second of course and how we do that is percent and then a zero and four and D and basically any space that's not taken up by the number that we pass in is gonna give us leading zeros we can also do left justified so let's go format and then we're going to put a percent sign and negative four and D and left justified just so you can see what that is and let's use our long once again. And we can also do similar things with our doubles. And let's bounce back up inside of this guy. And I'm going to say a double and 1.234. Should have left those in there before, huh? And then jump back down here. And then I'm going to say three decimals. And to do that, you go percent, and you can do the leading zeros and all the other stuff if you'd like, and an F whenever you're working with doubles, which stands for float. 
and there we are and we can uh, go and compile this once again control C control K that is going to compile that guy it's gonna ask me if I want to save the file I'm gonna say yes and now I can go through here and execute all these just by going to the end of the line and control X and control E and there you can see it went and put that string inside of there you can see there we have our spaces see there we have leading zeros right there left justified and then finally you can see how it is putting in only three decimal places for a double well I guess our double only had three spaces but either way it would work if you had five all right so there is a whole bunch of ways of formatting output and now what I'd like to do is show you how we can do a whole ton of things with strings all right so let's define a string I'm gonna just call this str1 and I'm gonna say this is my second string so we defined that and now we can do a whole bunch of manipulations with it I can check if it is blank or not by just going string and then we're going to go blank and question mark str1 however if I do that it is not going to have that available for me so what I need to do is I need to go up inside of here right after I have the namespace part and I'm going to say require and closure string and then I'm gonna go as, and I'm gonna say that it needs to be a string, okay? Or it's going to have the shortened name of string. I can put the whole closure string thing in there, but that's too long and, you know, don't wanna do that. So here we go, we got that inside of there. Now we can test some more things. I could come in and check if my string contains or includes, and pass in the string you wanna check and the word you're looking for. So I'm specifically looking for my in this situation. You can see that this comes back as false. And then likewise, you're going to be able to see that this is going to come back as true because my is in there. Remember, you might have to you might have to compile if you're using Emacs with control C and then control K. All right. And let's try some more. You can also come in and we can check for an index or get the index of a match. So we could go index of and then the string that we're going to be searching for and then the specific thing that we're going to be looking for which is my we're going to be able to split a string into a vector once again I'm going to use the str command and this time we're going to use split and str1 and then what I'm going to use to split I'm going to use the hash symbol and I'm going to say spaces is what I want to use for the split you could use a regular expression or something else like that if you'd like you could also go and split based off of here let me give you an example of how we could use that so string one and then we can do a hash symbol and say we want to split based off of the location of a number we could do so We'll also be able to come in here and join a collection, which I'm gonna do more about here later. Just right now, if you're, you can just think of a collection as like an array, if you don't know what a if collection, you know, collections is a general grouping of data. So let's say I have a collection that has the and big and cheese inside of it. That join will join those and put a space between each one of them. I can also do a replace so let's do a regular expression replace so replace and i can have i am 42 and then i can do a hash symbol of course i could put string one in there or whatever if i would want and then i'm going to do regular i want to replace 42 with 43 and that's perfectly legal as well i'm also going to be able to remove white space at the beginning and the end with string and trim new line and likewise i'll also be able to trim any white space on the left like that and any white space on the right like that we're also going to be able to make a string all uppercase if you would like to do that sometimes we do that whenever we're checking for specific things uh, we could do that and let's jump back to the beginning of that and put that parentheses inside of there and you know if you're going to be able to do that you're also going to be able to do lowercase lowercase I normally find is a little bit more useful so let's go lower and dash and case and string one once again and I think that's a good rundown of a whole bunch of different things so I'm gonna go and compile this with control C and control K and I'm gonna jump down to the bottom with CX and O well oh, it's wants to make sure I want to save it yes CX and O and then down inside of this guy I am going to bring main up we can execute it We've got a bug what's that bug 
and it's saying that I got an error with the split. Oh, I see what I did. I forgot to do, let's jump back over inside of here and let's change this to string one and that error will go away. So let's go and compile that once again and jump back down to the bottom after we save it and we can execute that. And this is my string pops up. Then I can jump back over to the top again and jump through all these different guys and execute all of them up here. And you can see that that comes back as a string. That's what's being returned. And then I can jump down here and see if that is a blank string comes back as false, of course. And we can come in and execute this. Does it include the word my? Yes, it does. We can come in there and get the index for my. We could also come in and we can split and put a where the spaces are located inside of our string and you're going to see there's that collection we can also split at the number and you can see there that is likewise we're going to be able to join a collection into a string and there's that answer we can replace our values using regular expressions. We're gonna be able to change to uppercase and we're gonna be able to change to lowercase. All right, so there is a rundown of the core functions you're gonna to use to work with strings. And now I'd like to talk about our first collection, which is lists. Okay, so everything I'm doing here, of course, is still inside of main. Now, basically a list is just going to store a list of values and it can store multiple different data types. So let's come in and we'll go print line. And to create a list, you just start it with list and then you can throw whatever you'd like inside of there. I'm just gonna show you that you can do anything you'd like and we can throw a Boolean inside of there as well. And there we go. And if I execute that down on the bottom, you're going to see all of the list items that I have inside of there. We could also come in here and you can also see I'm using print line that is going to go and get whatever I give to it and then put a new line at the end of it. I can also use first, which is actually very useful as you're gonna see later. And I could do something like list and two and three and I executed that and you can see that one comes back down at the bottom of the screen. I can also come in here and get everything except that and you can see down at the bottom, two and three come back. I can also get a specifically defined index. And how you do that is by going nth. And then right inside of here, let's say I wanna go and get index one, I can do so. And you see that that comes back as two. I'd also be able to come in here and add values to my list. And how I'd specifically do that is go list and star. And then let's say I have one and two, and then I want to add in three as well as four. Of course I can do that. Whoops, got a little bit of an error, probably because I had too many parentheses inside of there. Yes, that was what it was. Actually, I need to get rid of that parentheses right there. And there, that should be fun. And you can see at the bottom, I got one, two, three, and four. And then I would also be able to add one value to the left of a list by going cons. And let's say I want to throw three inside of there. Just do that, put that there, and then throw one more parentheses at the end. And you can see at the bottom, I have three, one, two. All right, so there's a whole bunch of different ways of working with lists. And now what I want to talk about are sets. Okay, so sets are going to be lists of unique values. And how you create one of those is you go set. And then what I'm gonna do after that is I'm going to put a single quote inside of there. And let's go and throw one and one and two inside of there. And if I execute that, you can see that it only shows the one value. So like I said, it's going to be unique values. I'm going to be able to get specific indexes inside of a set just by using get. And let's say that this is three and two. Then what I'm gonna do outside of here is, let's say I wanna get the second index. I can put that right there. And if I execute it, you can see that the two shows up here at the bottom of the screen. I'm gonna be able to do conjoin if I want to append a value. As you can see right there, we have three and two, but as you can also say, let's go and do one instead so that it shows up a little bit better. So there's that. And now you can see one, three, and two. Okay, makes sense. We're also going to be able to check if a set contains a specific value by going contains. And let's say I want to check for two and you can see that that comes back as true. And I'm also going to be able to come in here and do disjoin. And let's say I want to remove the two from inside of our set. I can do so. And you can see that we are left with only three. Once again, 
a rundown of the core functions you're going to be using whenever you deal with sets. And now I want to talk about vectors. All right, so let's go and to create a vector, you go vector and I'm going to say one and dog is what I'm going to throw inside of my vector. Now to create a vector, all you would do is you would go vector and then whatever data you want to put inside of it. More specifically, if I would like to get a specific index from a vector, I would just go get and let's go and get the first value out of there. And you can see the two comes up here at the very bottom of the screen. I'm also going to be able to use conjoin once again if I would like to append an element to a vector. And let's say that I want that to be one. That's perfectly fine. And you can see it, three, two, one shows up there. If I'd like to remove the first item outside of a vector, I can do that. And you can see I'm left with just the three inside of my vector at the bottom of the screen. And let's go and add a couple more values inside of here. One, two, three, and four. And let's say that I would like to return a vector from one point to another. I could do so. Let's, so let's say I want to go from one to three. I would then have to change this to subvec. Oops, subvec. And we can execute that. And you can see I'm left with just, or you can see that I retrieved two and three out of our vector. All right, so quick rundown of the core things you're gonna need to know to use vectors. And now I wanna talk about maps. Now a map is just a collection of key value pairs. And to create a map, we're just gonna go hash and map. And we can just define our key, which is going to be name. And then we can put in our actual value. And then you just keep on going. Next one, it just knows that the next one's gonna be your key. And then you can just put whatever you'd like inside of there. And if you go and execute that, you can see that they show up down there at the bottom of the screen. You can also create what are called sorted maps. So let's go and create a couple different things inside of here. I'm gonna have my key be three and put 42 inside of there. And then I'll have two and Banis and then one and Derek. And you can see when I execute that, it's gonna put all of them in order based off of whatever the numerical index is. We're also going to be able to get a value based off of a mapped key by going hash map or creating a hash map and using git. And then I'll define what my key is just to keep this simple. I'm just going to use one. And then here at the very end, I'm going to put what I'm specifically searching for. And you can see that I brought back Derek just like that. Let's go throw a couple more in here. And another thing I'm going to be able to do is get a value for a key. And to do that, I'm gonna use find, and might as well use name again. And you can see it came back and gave me the key as well as the proper value that I was specifically looking for. Let's say I want to also check if a map contains a specific key. For doing this in other places, we use contains, and of course it makes sense to use contains once again. And we execute that, and you can see it comes back as true. Let's go and get rid of this guy specifically. And then let's say that we wanted to come in and get a list of keys. Well, we could just type in keys and it's gonna give us that. And there is age and name. Well, I'm gonna jump down here and make this slightly bigger. Yeah, it looks a little bit better. And as you may have guessed, if you wanna get all the values in the map, you just type in vowels inside of there. And once again, execute, and you can see that only the values came back. And also you're going to be able to finally merge maps. And let's go and have these be separated. So let's put this like that. And then let's create another hash map, just so you can see that they are indeed merged. And then we will just call this merge with, and then put a plus sign inside of there. I think I have everything set up right. Let's just make sure. Yep, everything's fine and execute it. And you can see that they have been merged. All right, so there is a whole bunch of things you can do with maps. And now I wanna talk about atoms. And to cover atoms, I'm gonna go into a vertical format so you can see a little bit better. Basically, I'm gonna create a function here. It's gonna demonstrate all the different things you can do with atoms. Basically, with atoms, you are going to actually be able to change a variable's value. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a function. This is how we, I'm gonna do get more specifically into functions here in a bit. But this is the function, how we define it. It's called atom ex for atom example. It's going to receive one attribute passed to it. And if you wanted to define an atom's value, you do define just like before. And I'm gonna call this atom ex. And then I'm gonna call go and create atom and x using x as our value that we're gonna assign to our atom. 
Now, watchers can be attached to atoms, as well as agents, which you're going to see here in a minute. And they can then be used to run functions whenever a value changes. And to create a watcher, you just go add and watch. And then you're going to say atom ex and for specifically what I want to watch and watcher. And then we can define our function. And then you'll say key and atom old state. And you're going to be able to get the old version or the old value stored inside of our atom as well as the new value stored inside of our atom and then we can print those out to the screen just to see how they have been changed so we can go atom ex changed from and then old state and then to new state and then close off that watcher and now what we'll do is we'll go print line and we'll go first x, which is going to be the first value for our atom. And we can get that by putting the at sign followed by atom ex. We can then change the value. And how you change the value for our atom is you go reset exclamation point and the atom you want to change and the value you want it set to. And then once again, I can go print line and second x, which is going to be the new version for our atom. Once again, at atom ex to get that value and you could also go and change the value using a function and to do that you go swap exclamation point atom ex and let's say i want to increment the value that is inside of there i can do so and you can put any function in there not just increment and then i'll say increment x and once again get the value of our atom with the at sign ex and then finally let's close off our function altogether and there that did that okay so now what i can do is i can come down here into our main function and we can call that and how we call it is we go whoops parentheses adam ex and let's pass five inside of there and then we can compile that with control c and control k and save it and i had a bug there it's add dash watch okay control c control k save it and and that time I spelled Adam wrong. Internet, you should tell me that. Okay, Control C, Control X, and save it. And I got rid of all of our bugs. And now we can jump over here and execute it by just calling main. And you can see all of the different changes that we have. So the first value of X was five, which as we set it, you saw that before. So there it is. We started off by passing the value of five into here and the value was set. You can see here, Adam EX changed from five to 10. And you can see right there that we printed the change. And then we can see once again, Adam EX changed from 10 to 11. You can see the watcher is called before the actual change takes place. And then you can see incremented it to 11. All right, so it is possible to change values using atoms if you should so want to do that. And since I'm talking about that, I'm gonna talk about another way to change values. And that is through the use of what are called agents. Now an agent's gonna allow us to change values using functions. I'm gonna define another function here and I'm gonna call it agent ex. And this isn't gonna get past anything, so I'm just gonna leave that empty. If you wanna create an agent, you let's say we wanted to check the number of tickets that we're selling for a show or something. I'll call this ticket, sh uh, ticket sold. And I'm gonna give it a starting value of zero because we didn't sell any tickets yet. We're then gonna be able to add a value to an agent. So it starts off at zero and we'll go ticket sold. And we will say that we wanna change the value to 15. Well, there that goes. Then we can print out our changed or our, our new value for tickets. And I'm gonna show you here something that's a little bit of a glitch. And then I'll also show you how to fix it. So I'm gonna put that there. If you wanna get the ticket sold, again, you're going to use the at symbol and ticket sold. And let's just close that off so that I can show you a little bug and then also show you how to fix it. Let's jump down into main and let's call agent EX. And don't forget to compile it. And we have one parentheses, of course. And don't forget to compile it and save it. Whoop, a little bit of a bug. Need to save that. All right, put that space inside of there. All right, save it. Got rid of all our bugs. And then we can come in and execute main. And you're going to see that tickets actually shows as zero. So that's a bad thing. One way that we could get rid of that is we could go and call print line ahead of time. So just throw a brand new print line inside of there. 
and we can execute it. Now you see the tickets 15 shows up, but another way that we can do is we can call for us to wait for a value to update. And how you do that is with a function called await for. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go send and tickets sold once again, plus 10, and then I'm gonna call await for. So I'll say await for 100 for tickets sold and it's going to give it a chance to update and now whenever i call print line it is going to be perfectly fine so i can go tickets and at and tickets sold and another thing that you need to do is shut down your agents whenever you're done and so i'm going to go shut down and agents and i'm going to compile this guy and save it don't have any errors cool and to demonstrate this, I'm actually going to show you how to use the line and gen repo. So opened up a new shell and I'm going to type in line and repo. And there we go. Have that all set up. And now I can come in here and use main. And you can see if I execute that with main that we have tickets for 15 and then tickets are changed to 25. So there is a rundown of a lot of the things you can do with agents. And now I want to talk about our math function. Okay, as per math functions, there are many of them, of course, and you're going to do this a little bit different in Clojure than you might be used to in other languages. So let's say we wanted to add a couple numbers. We would first put in the operator we wanted to use and then followed with the things we wanted to add. And likewise, it's going to be like that for everything else. And so if you want to just, just continuously subtract values, that's how you would do that. And also we could do multiplication, of course, in the same way. Let's multiply two times five. That's how that would be done. And division as well. And if you'd like to get the remainder of a division, you would use modulus just like you can see right there. All right, and just to save time, there are numerous other different functions available for you. And there you can see them all. You could pause your screen or just get the cheat sheet or whatever. If you want to increment, you just use INC, decrement, DEC. This is the absolute value. You're going to have to put math in front of it there, though, to have it work. And the cube root, square root, if you want to round up, round down. E to the power of 1, the hypotenuse, that's what that is. The natural logarithm, the base 10 logarithm. If you give it a whole bunch of numbers, it'll give you the max value, the minimum value. And you can also ca calculate power. And also, so I don't forget... You're also going to be able to generate random values. So we can go print line. And how you do that is you would go random int. And it's going to go up to but not include the 20 in this situation. And you're also going to have cosine and sine and tangent and arc cosine, arc sine, arc tangent, and so forth and so on. Another thing that's useful is you can perform a operation on a collection. So I could do something like one, two, and three, and I'll, I'll calculate all this out for you so you can see exactly what that does. And likewise, you'll be able to do the negative for that also. And also there's built-in values. So you also have things like math pi to get the value of pi if you'd like to use that as well. And we could save that and jump over to the other screen. And here we're using line engine. And if you want to go and reload that, this is the command you use. It's just going to be use and whatever your file is followed with reload. And then if you run main, you're going to see all of the calculations for everything that we have there. All right. So and there's our random value and there's pi and so forth and so on. So that's a quick rundown of a lot of the math functions available to us. And now I'm going to focus in on all the things we can do with functions. So as I have covered already, you're going to define your function by typing in DEF followed with an N. And I'm going to create one called say hello. And right here is where you'd have attributes if you have any. And in this situation, well, actually, you can provide a description for, you know, your function inside of here. So you could say something like receives a name with one parameter and responds. Okay, so there's a description. Then you're going to have your attribute. And in this situation, it's going to be name is what's going to be passed inside of there. And then you can output something onto the screen. So you could say something like hello again, and then follow that up with name and then close that off. Of course, let's go and create a couple more. 
let's say you want to receive more than one value let's go and call this get sum and it's going to get x and y and the output from the last operation inside of your function is what's going to be returned by default so you can see right there it's just going to return whatever that sum is you're also going to be able to receive an unknown number of parameters or attributes, whatever you want to call them. So let's go call this get some more. And I'm going to define first off what I'm going to do if I receive three parameters inside of here. I'm going to get the sum of them, of course. So that's just going to be X, Y, and Z. And then you notice there's parentheses surrounding that whole entire thing. And then I'm also going to have a situation on which I receive two attributes passed inside of here. And I'm going to sum those as well. And that closes off that function. Let's go and create another one. You can also receive a variable number of parameters in a list. So here we can go define and I'll call this hello you and I will put name inside of there and here I will use the string function to concatenate all of the values here and you're gonna see what that looks like here in a moment I'm gonna put a space inside of there so that that works and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call well make sure I close off this function first there we are and now I'm gonna call hello you over and over and over again with a function called hello all so define and hello all and in this situation, we're going to receive multiple different, uh, you know, we're going to receive a list. So this is going to be names. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass those values to hello you. And how I can do that is by typing in map, hello you and names, and then close that off. All right, so I got a whole bunch of these different functions inside of here. And now we can run them all. So I'm going to go down inside of main and I'm going to go say hello and then I'll pass in Derek and then I will call the next one which is going to be get sum and to that I'm going to pass in four and five and then get some more and one two and three and then we can do whoops make sure you put parentheses around both of them there like that and then we can also come in and I can pass in multiple different values for hello all so you can see what that looks like when we pass in a list so I can just say Doug and Mary and Paul okay and everything else there looks pretty good so I'm gonna save that and jump over into the other part side of the screen and I'm going to reload all that and then we can run main and you can see right here, hello again, Derek comes back. And you can also see here where we are going and creating a list for all those different values that were passed inside. Oh, and I'll come up here and print out all of these guys. So we'll go print line. All right, we got all that saved and bounce over to the other screen. And it says I got an error at 16, that's fine. Let's bounce over to the other screen. And then I'm gonna go MX and line num dash mode right like that if you can see it and now we can see all those and I don't have enough closing parentheses is that what that is yeah that's what that was and this one has four so everything should be fine there let's just verify it yeah okay and that closes off the entire function so that's good Control X Control S and jump over to the other side of the screen now everything should be fine and it was and if I run those you can see that they print out hello Derek and hello again Derek and both of the calculations we put inside of there as well as our list all right so good stuff and that's a rundown of simple functions we're going to do advanced functions here very very soon but now I want to talk about decision making now in regards to decision making we need to understand relational operators now there's if you want to check for equality you're going to use equals not double equals if you want to check for not equal that's actually going to be not equal like that Everything else is going to be the same. So less than, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. And here I'll just give you a couple quick examples. Again, you're going to first put your operator and then you're going to follow that up with the two things that you want to check for. And you're going to see down there that comes back as false. And let's just go and show you not equals and four and five also. 
and how that works. You see that that comes back as true. All right, and everything else works exactly the same. We also have logical operators, which is going to be and, or, and not. And so let's do and, and we'll just do true and false. And you see that comes back as false. You could do or, and oh, don't forget your parentheses, or, and you're going to have true and false also and let's just do not true of course that's going to basically anything that you pass to it it's going to give you the opposite so not true of course is going to give you false all right so now i want to show you how that would work with if then and else so again we're going to come in here and we're going to create a function and it's going to be called can vote and i'm going to be passed in an age and then we will return certain things depending upon if the person can vote or not so I'm going to use an if statement here and then I'm going to follow that up. I want to check if greater than or equal to and then what this translates into is age greater than or equal to 18. And then what we're going to do is the first thing that we see inside of here is what's going to be executed if it is true and what is going to be executed otherwise is good is if that comes back as false. So we're going to go, you can't vote. All right, and that is how that operates. And, and of course, don't forget to close off your function. All right, let's do another one. You're also going to be able to come in and uh, calculate or have more than one statement executed if something is true or false and use do to do that. So I'm gonna call this can do more and this is gonna receive an age and then what it's gonna check for, it's gonna say if age is greater than or equal to 18 and then underneath of this I'm gonna put do and parentheses and then I'll go print line and you can drive and then underneath of that you can say you can vote and then you can close the do part out as you saw it did right there and then you could put you could either have another do statement inside there and do multiple different things or you can just have one thing show up and you can go in there and practice with that if you'd like and i didn't close off that quote and see you can see and there we go our function is closed now let's do one more let's do a demonstration of how win is working and basically you're going to use when when you want to do many things if something is true so i'm going to say define when example and tof and then i'm going to say when true or false is what that means when true then i'm going to say that i want to do the first thing and print line the second thing and then let's close that off all together and what the heck I'm also going to cover condition and basically what this is going to do is check for multiple different conditions so let's create another function so I'm going to say that what grade is what this is going to be and it's going to receive a age and it is going to do different things depending upon the value of that you'll use condition a lot all right so we're going to say if the age that was passed in there is greater than five or less than five i mean in that situation we are going to return preschool and we'll use a print line in that situation otherwise we can check something else we can say if it is equal to five well in that situation we are going to put kindergarten inside of there and then we can say and if n is greater than five you can see how we're able to use the logical operator there and then we just put in the other thing we want to compare n is less than or equal to 18 well in that situation we want to close that off like that what i'm going to do here is use format and i'll say go to grade and then we will calculate what grade that should be and in this situation it's going to be n minus five so there we are otherwise else if no matter what else we can say go to college all right so it handles everything you could ever want it to do now let's come down here and let's run these guys so you can see exactly what the output looks like for them so first off i'm going to say can vote so first off i'm going to say can vote and i will pass into that 17 and then we are going to have can do more remember that's going to do more than one thing and here i'll put 24 inside of there and then we're going to have or demonstrate our win example that we had 
and I'm just gonna pass true into that. And then finally we can do what grade and pass 19 into that. And we can save that with control X and S and then we can jump over to the other screen and if I did everything right, this will execute. I'm holding meta key and P to get all these to come up. Looks like it's okay and main. And there you can see. So we went and passed in a value. You can't vote. What did we pass in? We passed in 17. So 17 into there and it came back as you can't vote. And then over here, I passed in 24 and both you can drive and you can vote popped in. You can see here, whenever this is true, it's gonna execute multiple different statements. And then here we passed in the value of 19 and it says go to college. All right, so there is a rundown of numerous different things you can do conditionally. And now what I wanna talk about is looping. All right, the very first looping option I'm gonna cover here are while loops, and it's going to loop while condition is true. Let's go and create a function once again, and I'm gonna call this one, two, x, and it's going to receive whatever the value of x is. Got one more parenthesis in there than I need. So x is that guy right there. And then what I'm gonna do is I need a way to increment a value, and I'm gonna use an atom to do that because atoms allow us to change the value. So I'm gonna go atom one. Then after that, I can loop while a condition is true. So I'm gonna say while the atom value is less than or equal to, and to get the value of an atom, I go at symbol and I. And then I'm gonna put X inside of there because X is the number of times we're gonna loop. Then after that, we're gonna go do, and we're gonna list all the things that we want to print on the screen in that area right there, which is just gonna be the value of that. All right, whoops, I keep putting one I is what I'm looking for. And then after that, we're gonna have to increment the value. And once again, as a review to increment, you go swap and the exclamation mark, and you call the increment value. So we can close all of those guys right there. And I'm gonna show you another one. Let's do do times loop. Basically, this is gonna execute a statement a set number of times. So let's go create another function. I'm gonna call this double to x. And it's gonna receive x, of course. And basically, i is gonna be incremented each time through. So I'm gonna say do times and i and x. And then after that, I'm gonna go print line and I'm gonna multiply everything here. So I'm gonna multiply i times two and we can close off that function. Let's do another loop. Let's use loop. Okay, so loop is going to go through values using a statement called recur to change the value until a condition is no longer true. So this guy is going to triple to x. So I'm gonna call him, it's gonna triple all those values to the value of x and we're gonna pass in X and Y in this situation. I'm gonna set my starting value of I in this situation. So we're gonna go loop and I, whoops, I and X. So I is gonna be assigned whatever the value for X is. And then I'm gonna cycle as long as we have a true statement. So we're gonna go from I, or go from the value of X to Y. So here, I'm gonna say, wow, i is less than y we are going to continue to loop and then i will put inside of here all of the things that i want to happen i want to multiply whatever the value for i is times three and that's going to triple everything and then of course we're going to have to come in here also and increment the value and like i said you're going to use recur to increment that value so plus i and one. So there's numerous different ways we can do everything inside of Clojure. All right, so we have all those set up and let's go and run them inside of main. I'm gonna call one, two, X and pass in the value of five to that. And then after that, I am going to call double two X and pass in five for that. And then I'm gonna call triple two X and it's going to triple everything, and we're gonna go from one to five for that guy, and we'll save it. And as long as I did everything right, this guy should run perfect. Looks like I did, we'll find out. And there you can see, it went and printed the values one through five, and here it went and doubled those values, and here we see that we tripled those values. All right, and there is one other looping construct that's available for us. Let's go and show you that. That is do sequence, and it's used for iterating through a sequence. 
and we just go like this and here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say that I want to print a list and this is how we receive a list of items if you missed that whenever I covered it whenever I was talking about functions before you put the and symbol in there like that right before nums and do sequence and x is going to be the temporary holding cell for each value of nums that is pulled out and then inside of here i can just print out what i want to show up on our screen and then we can come down here and we can call print list so i'm going to go print and list and i'm just going to go seven eight and nine and save that jump over here and got that like that and main and you can see it just printed seven, eight, and nine. All right, so there are a whole host of ways we can loop. And now what I wanna talk about is file IO. All right, so what are we gonna do? Well, the very first thing that I want to do is I need to get a library that's going to allow me to do file IO. So this is gonna be closure.java.io. And then I'm gonna define a function that, I'm gonna define a couple functions that read and write files. So define a function, and I'm gonna call this write to file. And there's very creative words used inside of closure. It's kind of fun. All right, so what I'm gonna receive here is the file name and the text that I want to write to the file then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a function called with and open and with open is gonna open and close the file and then write the string to the file that I provide and to write to it you use the writer statement and I'm gonna say writer and the file that is provided that it wants me to use and then to write to it I'm gonna go dot and write and use the writer to write the text that was provided okay so pretty simple now if i want to read from a file i'm going to create a function called read from file and here i'm just going to receive whatever the file name is and i might as well cover exception handling also so for this is going to handle a situation in which i try to read from a file that doesn't exist so for exception handling you're going to surround everything with try and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to say print line whoops forgot my parentheses print line and slurp is, is the command you use to read from a file so i told you it was kind of interesting there and that's going to close off my try block. And then if I want to catch a potential error, I'm going to say catch exception E. And then I can just print an error message here that I want to show if I was unable to read from a file. So, and that is going to be retrieved by calling get and message and E specifically. And then we can close out all of those different guys. And also, with let's come, I'm going to show you also how to append text to a file. So let's define another function. We'll call this append to file. My names aren't as creative as the creators of Clojure. And here I'm going to go file and text. And I'm going to use with open again. Like I said, it's going to open the file and then close it for me whenever it's done. So that's good. Here I am going to, well, I don't want to do that. I want to use my writer. So with open and writer, and then I'm going to say writer and provide whatever the file is. And then to show that you want to append, you're going to mark append as true. And then after that, you can call write and refer to the writer and the text that you want to append. Okay, so there's that. And let's say I also want to read one line at a time. These are all the different ways to working with files. So I'm going to say read line from file. Give this a little bit of a longer name. And here I just provide whatever the file name is in that situation. And then I'm, once again, I'm going to use with open, just like I did before. And here I will use my reader and reader and whatever the file is that I want to be working with. And then I am going to use do sequence to read out that line, put line inside of here and line once again, sequence and refer to our reader. And then in this situation, I want to call print line to print that line. All right, and if I did everything right, let's go Control X and Control S. Whoops, I forgot I'm gonna have to also come down and call our functions inside of main, no big deal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call write to file 
and I have to give it whatever the uh, file is going to be called. So let's call this test file instead of text. So test, and we're just writing text files here, and whatever I want to write into it. So I'm going to say this is a sentence, and then if I want to put a new line inside of there, I just go like that, and there's a new line. All right, what else can we do? Well, we can call read from file. And remember, I just pass in whatever file I want to read from, and that's it. And it automatically is going to work for me. And I'll also demonstrate append to file. And I'm going to say the file that I want to append to and the text I want to put in it. So I'll say this is another sentence and throw in another new line and close that off. And then if I just want to read one line from a file, I go read line from file and test and text, right like that. All right, let's do control X, control S, control X and O and meta key P. And did I get it all right? No, I didn't. I had a little bug here. What did we do wrong? Ah, I forgot to put this R right there. No big deal. All right, got that saved. Jump back over here again. Whoops, forgot to put a parentheses there. And then of course, I'm gonna have to put another parentheses down there. And there it looks like I got it. And let's execute it. And you can see that it properly wrote to our file. So whenever we wrote to our file, then we were calling back from it. So we have, this is a sentence. So this is a sentence was printed back to us. We wrote to it first, then we read from it. So that's, this is a sentence or this one right here. And what did I use a print line inside of there? Yeah, read that, that print line there. And also the print line from actually writing it to the file, which is this line right here. And then I read both of them, the whole entire file. And then I said that I want just one of the, the lines from the file. All right, so there we go. Whole bunch of different ways to interact with files using Clojure. And now I'd like to talk about destructuring. All right, so destructuring means basically the binding of values in a data structure to symbols. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm just gonna call this destruct and it's not going to receive anything just to keep this very simple. Then I'm gonna define vector values and I'll put one and two and three and four inside of here. And now what I wanna do is assign values to symbols and I'm gonna use let here and I'm gonna have one, two, and the rest. And the rest is gonna store any remaining values that I don't, you know, wasn't prepared to use. And then I'm gonna put vect vowels after that. And then I can print out all of this information. And I can just refer to the symbols. So one, two, and then the rest. And then down here, I can just come in and call destruct and you'll see how this works. Or see that it works actually. Whoops, forgot to put the rest. Sorry about that. All right, run it, everything's fine. And if we run main, you're gonna see that it printed all those out. Okay, so that's how destruct works. Trying to cover just about everything. Now let's talk about struct maps. Now struct maps are gonna be used to define more complex custom types. So what I wanna do is create another function. I'm gonna call this struct map example and it's not going to receive anything and to define a struct you're going to go define and struct and i'm going to call this customer and then you're going to define all of the things that your customers are going to have so my customers are going to have a phone number and a name then what I want to do is define a struct object. To do that, just go define customer one, and then struct, followed by your struct name, followed by the name you want to use, and our telephone number, okay? And you can also assign two specific keys if you'd like to. So we can go define customer two, and struct map, and define your struct map you want to use, and then name, and then list a specific name. So we could do Sally after that, and then we could have refer to our phone number, and yeah, just do whatever, and close that off. And then to print information, we can just go just like we always do, call print line or format or whatever you want to call customer one and you're also going to be able to access individual fields so you can say print line and just to prove that we're able to get customer two to work I'm gonna go name and customer two and there we go 
and then we can just come down here and struct map map example and if i didn't get anything wrong that should work perfectly and look at that i did it right and there you can see that those worked all right so another very quick example of how to use struct maps and now i'd like to talk about the advanced functions available with closure all right, so we're gonna be able to use anonymous functions inside of Clojure, and those are just gonna be functions that don't have a name. So let's say that I would want to create a list by multiplying all values by themselves. Just to keep that simple, I'm gonna do this over here. So we would use our map function, and what this is saying, here's our anonymous function we have right here, see, function, but there's no name assigned to it. So what it's gonna do is we're using the range function here to generate values from one through nine, up to 10, not including 10. And it's gonna take each of those values, it's gonna throw them inside here, multiply them times themselves, and then map is gonna take all those different values and create a brand new list. So you can see exactly how that works. And here I wanna just go in here and show you another example. I'm gonna write this out by hand. So I'm gonna say map. Let's say that we would wanna come in here and multiply everything times three. And I'm gonna use what is called a compact anonymous function this time. So instead of putting fn inside of there, we can also go in, put a hash symbol inside of there and then multiply, which is the operation. And then a percent sign is going to represent the value that is going to be pulled from our list. And then three is gonna represent the value we wanna multiply at times. So then this is a compact anonymous function. Once again, we're gonna close that off. And you're gonna see once again that we were able to go through and multiply all those times three. Okay, so we see an anonymous function as well as a compact anonymous function. And you can also have compact anonymous functions that receive two arguments. So for example, let's come in here and let's do hash symbol and multiply and percent one is gonna represent the first argument and percent two is gonna represent the second one. And then we can follow that up with our two arguments that we have. And you can run that and you'll see that it multiplied two times three. All right, so there you go. There are compact as well as regular old anonymous functions inside of Clojure. Now let's jump back over here and I wanna show you an example of a Clojure. And basically, closures are going to be used to return custom functions. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to define um, a custom multiplier is what I'm going to call this. Or you know what? I'm going to run this inside of our REPL again, just so you can see exactly, that, see that you can do this inside of here. So I'm going to go define and custom multiplier and and go down to the next line, nothing is wrong with that. I'm gonna call malt by, and then I'm gonna use our compact anonymous function here. So hash symbol and multiplication and percent and malt by is gonna be passed inside of there. So there you go, that is how we can create that function inside of there, and now we're going to be able to call it. So I'm gonna go and create another function and malt by three and I can call my custom multiplier closure and pass three inside of it. And now I can come in and call malt by three. So malt by three and let's multiply three times three. And you can see that we got nine back. So there you go. There is a demonstration of macros and we're getting very close to the end of just about everything. And now I wanna cover some different ways we can filter lists. So why don't we just stick with working in the REPL over here because this is working pretty good. Let's say, uh, one way we can filter list, or the, well, we have a couple different functions. We have take, drop, take while, drop while, and filter. I'm gonna demonstrate every single one of them. So, well, I don't even need print line in this situation. I can say take and two, and what this is going to do is take two of those values and leave the, or leave the rest of them there. Whoops, forgot to put that in there. Yeah, let's go get rid of that, all that mess. All right, so I'm gonna go take and two and get two values out of there so let's put one two and three inside of there make sure you close it off with the square brackets and you're going to see that it took the first two values out of there you're also going to have drop and let's say that we want to drop everything after our first so i'm going to say drop one and then one two and three and you can see that it got it eliminated the first element and just gave me back the uh, second and third. We're also going to be able to take what matches a condition using something called take while. So let's say we only want 
negative values from this list and we'll throw a negative one in there and you can use conditions or whatever you'd like and let's run that and you can see only negative one came we could also drop what matches a condition and that is drop while and let's just stick with our negative idea we have here so i'm going to go negative one and zero and one once again and you can see it gave me the zero and the one. And we could also return what matches with filter. So we can say filter and I'll use the compact anonymous function here. So I'm gonna go greater than and I'm gonna go percent two. So this is gonna say, I want everything that is greater than two returned to me. And I can say one and two and three and four. And there we go, and it returned three and four. And that's just about it. So to finish off the whole entire tutorial, I'd like to cover my last topic, which is gonna be macros. Now basically, a macro is going to generate code in line whenever you need to define when or if arguments should be evaluated. So it's a code generating tool that is extremely powerful. So let's, I'm gonna give you a bunch of examples here. So let's say that we wanted to have a macro that will print different discounts based on if the person is of the age of 65 or not. How you define a macro is you go define macro and we'll call this discount. And here I am going to put the conditions gonna be passed in. And then we're gonna have what happens with discount one or the first discount or the second discount or lack thereof in this situation. What we're then going to do to generate our code, but at the same time designate when we should refer to, while at the same time deciding what we wanna evaluate and what we don't wanna evaluate, we're gonna use something called syntax quoting. So here we are going to generate a list of commands and I'm then going to actually put inside of here what commands we're gonna use. So I am going to put a back quote right here and then I'm gonna follow that up with if. What that's saying is it's telling Clojure not to evaluate the if, but just return it so that we return a line of code and don't do anything with the if, okay? So what this is saying is if a condition is true, we want to print out discount one message Otherwise, we want to print out the discount to message, okay? So pretty simple. So let's jump down into main and we'll execute this. So I'm gonna define discounts. I can call it just like any other function. And here I'm going to be able to pass in a condition. So I'm gonna say greater than, and I'm gonna say the age of the person is 25 and I'm comparing that to 65. And the first message, if true, that's gonna print is going to be 10% off, 10% off and otherwise the next command that I'm going to print inside of here is going to be print line and here I'll say full price so if you're not over the age of 65 you have to pay full price and we can save that and jump over here and reload that and then call main and you can see that the person has to pay full price okay so that's a first example of how we can use macros let's do another one and this is gonna take some playing around with before you get it, but that's okay. So what I wanna do this time is, let's say that going and adding values like this is just driving you completely crazy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a way to be able to add in your normal way. So I'm gonna define a macro for that. So I'm gonna say define macro, and what I'm gonna call this is regular math. So you're gonna be able to pass this guy the regular way that you would do mathematics. So here it's gonna be calculation is what I'm gonna refer to that as. And here, once again, I'm gonna generate a list and I'm gonna create second calc. So what's gonna be passed inside of this is gonna be two plus five. What I'm saying is I wanna get the plus sign. That's the second thing that's gonna be passed inside. Then I wanna get the first thing that is passed inside. And then I want to get the last thing. And how we get the last thing is we refer to the nth and calc, and it would be two in this situation. And that should close off my macro. So now I'll demonstrate how that's gonna work. Here we'll just go regular and math. And then I can pass in my two plus five, okay? So that is how we are able to go and do that. So pretty cool stuff. And we can come in here and reload that and you're gonna see that seven comes back. All right, so there's another demonstration of a macro. Let's do another one. So let's say that we want to do or execute multiple different statements. We can do that with do. So I'm gonna say that I wanna define another macro and I'm gonna call this do more. 
and it is going to receive a condition and then it's going to have a body of statements a bunch of statements that we're going to want to execute here i'm going to once again generate a list and i do not want it to evaluate the if and i'm going to put in condition and then i'm going to construct all these and once again i don't want it to refer to the do and then i'm just going to throw body in just like that now what I can do is jump down into main and I can call this. So this is do more and do more. I'm gonna pass in the condition I want. So is one less than two? Now I think you know the answer to that. And then I can print all of the different things or I can list all the different commands that I want to execute inside of here. So this is gonna be multiple different commands. And you can have, of course, something other than print lines, but whatever. Okay, so. Hello again, and there that is. And here we can jump over here and we can reload and run main. And you can see that it executed both of those commands. All right, and to demonstrate one more thing, let's come up here and do another one of these. Whoops, okay, and there we go. And now to d demonstrate one more thing, I'm gonna go define macro here and I'm gonna call this do more two and we are going to have our condition that's going to be passed inside an and and body once again and what you're going to be able to do here is actually surround everything with syntax quoting and this is some some people prefer to do that and in that situation if you surround everything with syntax quoting which means don't evaluate anything then we're going to use what's called an unquote that is going to allow us to define what we do want to evaluate Okay, so to, let's just show you a demonstration. So instead, I could go and put the quote outside. So we're gonna go quote like this, there we are. And then we'll put if, and we'll say we don't want to evaluate that, but we do want to evaluate our condition. And then we can go in and say do, and if we want to evaluate multiple different things, we unquote it, put the at symbol, and follow that up with body, and then follow that up with that. And then we can come down and do more two and do similar sort of thing. We'll say, um, let's just do exactly the same thing actually, just to demonstrate that that will work. And there we go. And if we reload it and execute it, you're gonna see that it works that way also. All right, so there you go, guys. That is a heck of a lot of information about the closure language, and I think that'll set you straight on just about anything you're ready to learn. And just like always, please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.